Well, why why did you originally think that it was likely from the lab? Because we've seen in your correspondence with Fauci and Collins that you initially took a look at this along with other virologists and experts and said Mm -hmm. um, things like, I can't think of a plausible natural scenario. That was February 2nd, 2020, where you get a bat virus or one very similar to it. Um, where you insert exactly these amino acids and nucleotides that all have to be added and so on. And then you said, um, I I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. And then two days later, uh, well, then you spoke to Anthony Fauci and uh, Francis Collins, and then within days you completely reversed yourself and did a 180 and said it's lab, it it can't possibly be lab leak, it is nature. Yeah. So l- let me correct that a little bit. I mean, that that was one sure. email that, you know, ha- I had sent to, uh, you know, some of my colleagues that were looking at this one email out of hundreds of emails and and, you know, different kinds of Zoom calls and things like this, where we're discussing, you know, the possibilities about where this, you know, where this virus might have come from. And, and you know, my 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 colleagues and I w- who wrote that paper in Nature Medicine, you know, when we took on this, you know, sort of trying to figure out where it had come from, you know, we we told ourselves we need to be agnostic about all the different possibilities. We not, need to not let, you know, some of our priors and some of our, you know, previous experience, you know, really um, bias us. And, you know, if we would have come up with, you know, data and evidence that the virus had leaked from the lab, we would have been the first ones out there saying, you know, this virus leaked from the lab. So so that one email that you just read is, like I said, hundreds of emails. I actually wrote it, uh, you know, at an evening. I was at a Mardi Gras ball here. I'm in New Orleans, right? So, you know, I was typing on my iPhone there and, you know, just got this question, you know, you know what, what's the what's the evidence that, you know, this, this, um, you know, if you're in cleavage side is natural or not. And that's what I typed out. But, you know, as I, you know, got further in, into the, you know, the whole genome and looking at the virus, it, it came com- clear pretty quickly that, you know, this virus, you know, all these features that we were looking at were, were perfectly natural. So, you know, I, you know, there were some other people that I was dealing with, you know, you've heard the names Christian Anderson and Eddie Holmes and a few others, Andrew Rambo, that, you know, may have been a little bit more uh, open to the, you uh, the lab hypothesis early on until they started looking at it. I, you know, I was, I was, you know, always more of the, you know, on the, yeah, this is natural, you know, and I'm going to have to find something really, you know, unusual to make me think that it's going to be a, a lab leak. So like well, I forgive said, me, wasn't it just days, wasn't it just two days later that you reversed yourself and said, uh, actually, no, okay, I forget what I said about it coming from a lab. I'll, I now say it, it's It natural. wasn't really a, ver- a reversal. I mean, it's, it's what scientists do. You know, we kick around ideas, you know, we have, you know, private conversations sometimes you're playing devil's advocate I mean that's pretty much what I was mm-hmm. doing in that in that one email you know what can what'd I, you well what happened in those 48 hours what changed what what did you see well you looked at the genomes of the viruses more closely I mean in fact at that time too there was another you know piece of data that came out you know the famous pangul pangolin coronavirus right and uh, this this virus uh, when we looked at the genome of that and it happened all in that time frame you know there's another site besides the Fur and cleavage site that that we were focusing in on it's called the receptor binding domain and and that receptor binding domain also, you know, was causing us a little bit of, uh, you know, head scratching, you know, where did that come from? Because it was like, unlike any other, um, you know, receptor binding domain that we'd seen in, um, in any coronavirus anywhere. But, you know, what made the pangolin coronavirus so significant was, is that it's, RBD or receptor binding domain, this little fragment of the spike protein that helps the virus attach to the cell, um, was very similar to what was the RBD, the receptor binding domain in SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, that pangolin coronavirus was a natural virus. We knew that for sure. It wasn't a fake virus somebody just put on onto the you know, onto a website. But how does that prove? Right? So how does that prove anything about the about SARS-CoV two? How how do you? I can see why maybe yeah. you say, all right, that well, requires further study. It was, it was how do you very, in forty eight hours come out and, and publish a paper saying this is natural? I mean, because that what happened. The thing that bothered me when I fo- saw all this go down was why didn't all these experts? Because it's very suspicious. Talk to Fauci. Talk to Cal- Collins, who are mm-hmm. on record as not wanting this to be a lab leak. 
theory as, as saying this would be very damaging if that's what comes out. <laughs> and then suddenly all these virologists reverse themselves. Mm -hmm. And it, it's one thing if you can say, Megan, let me show you what I saw that proved to me. Yeah. It came, we found the pangolin. You know, that's yeah. why I'd say, gotcha. I get it. We, but there's nothing that proved this thing came from natural, yeah. from nature in those 48 hours. Nothing. Well, what know, happened I was mean, there was we, communication we saw that with Fauci and Collins. The binding domain was natural, you know, because it was in the pangolin. And, you know, if you find that site, you know, as a natural thing, then, you know, it's logical to make the, you know, to go to the next step and say, well, the whole thing is natural. And, and you know, let, let me step back to something that you just said about um, Drs. Fauci and Collins. They were agnostic about it, too. I mean, I, I you know, I never got any impression. That's not true. One of them. That's but, not true. Uh, well, because I mean, you know, we have their writings. What, I mean, I, you can, I forgive me because you can tell me what your conversation is. I'm just telling you what my, and only you know, that. you know, you can, you can come to a different conclusion, but you know, they, they didn't, you know, try to influence us when we wrote the nature paper or nature medicine paper, or, you know, even, you know, tell us, oh, you've got to write it this way or any way like that. They were, they were completely hands off on that. You know, they, they, they had just, what, what that conference was about, really, that teleconference on February 1 that, you know, there's been so much air about it, you know, and a lot of speculation and everything. I mean, really what, what happened was, you know, a lot of virologists were called together by, um, by Jeremy Farrar. He, um, is, uh, you know, the head of the Welcome Trust in the UK. And, uh, you know, he called his friend Tony Fauci, and Fauci uh, also got, you know, his boss on there, Francis Collins from the NIH. And, you know, and a bunch of other virologists that, you know, had expertise in how viruses emerge. And, uh, you know, this is, I think, perfectly natural. This is what you want people that are, you know, advising, you know, the, the president of the United States and Congress and, and also, you know, the, you know, the, the parliament in, in the UK. You want these people to get the best information that they possibly can. And, you know, I, okay, but let, let me jump in. Let me jump in. I, I yeah. accept all that. But let me let, this guy, Farrar, he's a Brit. He is the one who initially sent an email to Fauci and Collins yeah. expressing support for the lab leak theory, citing yeah. you, among others, yes. saying Robert Gary, quote, cannot think of a possible natural scenario, um, saying he, quote, uh, this other guy, Farzan, he says he was bothered by the fear insight and having a hard time explaining it outside the lab, saying Farzan favored the lab leak over natural origin, 70 to 30 or 60, 40. And then Farrar um, he wrote a book, actually, saying two other experts advising uh, Fauci and Collins were strongly in the lab leak camp. Christiana Anderson, who I know you've worked with and gotten research grants with, um, he put the lab leak theory at 60 to 70 percent. Eddie Holmes of Sydney put it at 80 percent and so on. Mm -hmm. And so this is all the information going into Fauci and Collins. Yeah. All of these but, top you know, experts, including but we yourself, changed their saying mind and, looks and, like, and some of us had changed, I got it. You changed their mind. I got it. I got, I got it. You, you changed your right? mind in 48 hours. In 48 hours. And what we do know, and I, know, I understand Collins may not have said it to you, according to you, but he is on record as saying we must, quote, put down this very destructive conspiracy theory, yeah. meaning the lab leak. So he didn't sound exactly open-minded yeah. So, so what, general let, let me put that uh, quote in a little bit more context. I mean, and I, I remember this, it's not, you know, and it's not well discussed, but, you know, there was actually a preprint that came out right around that time, right before that teleconference that said that basically, um, this SARS-CoV-2 was a hybrid or a chimera between, you know, some coronavirus and HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And that, that preprint was making a lot of, you know, rounds in the media and people were tabbing it. Oh, this is like the smoking gun. This virus came from a lab and they engineered it. They combined the most dangerous parts of uh, HIV, including that furin cleavage site into SARS-CoV-2. And, and this is, is really what I think, you know, Dr. Collins's quote is, is really addressing those, those dangerous conspiracy theories uh, uh, about, you know, the, the virus having been engineered and possibly, you know, put together with, uh, with HIV. The holidays, when our waists get bigger and our wallets get smaller. <laughs> it's the season when most companies want you to spend, spend, spend all your money. But Good Ranchers wants to help you save in a season of spending. Beef prices are estimated to increase another 20% early in 2023, continuing the largest price spike on meat in recent U.S. history. Good Ranchers is letting you lock in your price on all the meat you buy this November when you subscribe during their Black Friday savings. With my code, Megan, you can get their exclusive Black Friday offer of two free Black Angus New York strip steaks. You will inflation-proof your meat budget, get $70 of free USDA choice steaks, 
and save an additional 25 bucks on every box when you subscribe. Thousands of five-star reviews show why so many people are ditching the high prices and low quality of their grocery store for Good Ranchers instead. Treat yourself or someone you love to Good Ranchers' award-winning service and quality this holiday season. Remember to visit GoodRanchers.com slash Megan, or just use that code Megan when you check out to grab their best offer of the year. Black Angus is one of the premium breeds of cattle for high quality beef, so don't have a normal Black Friday this year. Have yourself a Black Angus Friday with two free steaks from Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.